doesn't it? Is it to you? It's kind of gentle. So we're going to play with, and, and we kind of did a preview of this by accident or by, um, you know, some of you were here two weeks ago when, when we just sort of sat down and had a little chat. Um, but, but today was the official questions and answers on the Science of Mind uh, Sunday. You, get, you got a little you know, practice run of that a couple of weeks ago for those of you who were here for that. We had a very small turnout for this service, and so rather than doing a talk, we just kind of sat down and had a chat. But there's some wonderful questions here today, and I thought I would um, start to play with, with a couple of these and, and, and um, go to some of the ones I think can be answered a little more quickly, and then go to the, some of the ones that are a little more deep. So the first one that came out is, did Ernest Holmes, who's the founder of Science of Mind, want Science of Mind to be a religion? Great question. And the answer was originally no. Originally, he saw this teaching as something that any Catholic, Jew, Protestant, uh, Muslim, anybody could follow, atheist, could follow and apply without ever leaving their church, without ever leaving their teaching. Because it's, a, it's the core of every teaching. Every teaching has this in it somewhere. And so he originally didn't see this as a standalone religion, a standalone teaching, but something to supplement or to bring out the best of every other religion. Okay? That was his original intention. Now what happened is, a whole lot of people would start listening to his lectures, and they would come up to him afterwards and say, look, you know, I, I spent the morning at my church, and I spent the afternoon listening to I'm the beloved of God, and they're teaching me that I'm a sinner, you know, and going to hell if I don't do it just exactly right. I can't listen to that stuff anymore. Can you do something about that? And so out of that process became more of a religion, and it's even still, the best way, as, as Reverend Mary knows, to start an argument among a group of, of religious science ministers is to ask, are we a religion? You know? And, and half of them will say yes, and half of them will say no, and, and you know, there will be this big discussion, and, and it's about the same as, as asking, are we Christian? You know, get that argument started also. And so, and the answer is yes and no. You know, it, the answer really is yes, in Ernest Holmes' terms, but, but a whole lot of people don't want to be associated with the traditional what Christian is, and we're not. And so, um, so was it a religion originally? No. But out of the need, out of the necessity, out of the fact that people didn't want to listen to some of the old style religion that they were hearing, it formed into its own standalone teaching, philosophy, way of life, where we now have centers. But this was not the original ver vision of, of Ernest. He did come around to it and have this and said, yeah, yes, let's do it. And he was, he was, um, um, licensing ministers and, and, and all that, uh, you know, after you know a, a fair, fairly short time. Does that answer whoever's question it was pretty well? Yes, thank you. Okay. So it wasn't necessarily started off. How can knowing spirit be a science? How can knowing spirit be a science? Science is involved in observing what is. You know, the Greeks were actually the start of Western science. And they observed the outside world. What is? Just what's happening? What is it about? It's observing, it's observing, it's observing. And learning, and learning, and learning. And that's what science is about. And so when we work with the science of mind, and this was originally called the science of mind and spirit, and mind is not necessarily our individual mind. Mind was Ernest's code word for God. It's mind with a capital M. It's mind of the universe, the whole oneness of the universe. And so... What is that that um, what we're doing is observing the mind and observing then the relationship with spirit and how if we get into alignment, as our reading said, our lives improve. And that's a science. It's, can I duplicate this? Every time I move into alignment with spirit, something good happens. Every time I move out of alignment with spirit, something that you know, I, don't, I feel out of sorts, I feel out of touch, happens. And so then that becomes the science of it. It becomes the observation of it. Can I repeat this? Can I do this over and over again? Can I, do, can I find that as I get closer to the Spirit, as I get more aware of the true nature of who I am and the true nature of what's, what, how the universe is operating, can I have the same experience, the oneness experience, over and over again? So hopefully that, that covers that. Um, So then we get into a couple of deeper ones. What does science mind say about children getting diseases? Mm -hmm. 
My teacher, Reverend Kathy Ann Lewis, was uh, one time at a, a, a minister's conference uh, with um, a number of ministers from all sorts of different denominations, and, and a couple, she was having a conversation with a couple of them, and, and they said, you know, yours is the toughest teaching, the toughest religion to follow, because you don't have a devil to blame things on. You know, you take personal responsibility for everything. You know, it's tough. And so we have what's, what can be called a hard teaching. So children getting diseases is that somewhere, either within them or within their environment, something is out of alignment. Right now, Oliver has a cold. My, my little five-month-old um, uh, you know, foster son. And, you know, we were talking about that. Cynthia and I were just talking about that yesterday. It's like, so... What is this about? And there's been some stuff in the environment. You know, we're, we're getting ready to, he's, he's getting closer and closer to departure time where he's going, going to go back to his birth parents because they've gotten their lives pretty much together. And there's some grief about that, especially on Cynthia's part. And there's been some, some congestion, let's call it, in the atmosphere around him. And so it's like children act out in three dimensions what's going on around them. That's one of my teachers used to say. And so children getting diseases may not be, and, and this is, um, this goes back to this great question that, that one of the disciples asked Jesus when he was healing somebody. He just healed somebody. And they said, so whose sin was that? Was that his sin or was that his father's sin? Because in, in the Hebrew text, they believe that the sins of the father are, are visited upon the son, right? And so it, it's like, so was this, did he do something wrong that God punished him? Or was it somewhere in his lineage that somebody did something wrong? that God punished him? And Jesus' answer is, none of the above. This is to glorify God. This was to glorify God. The healing of the young man, the healing of that person, and even the disease itself, to go through the process, is always to glorify God, is always to bring out the bestness, is always to give us something to bring up more of the God nature that I am. How many of us have had some sort of disease, and it may not be a physical disease, it might be a disease of our job, it might be a disease of our relationship, that when we get through it, we recognize that we are stronger, better people for it. Okay? We all have. Some of us just decide to start that agenda young, don't we? My personal belief, and this is not a science of mind teaching, my personal belief is the word conscious, and I think Ernest would agree, I know Ernest would agree with this, we are conscious before we ever take form. Okay? And so we may come in with an agenda that says it looks like this. I, I personally had a view of my life. I had a, a, a challenging childhood. There's people who've had far worse than I did, and people who've had far better, but I had a challenging childhood. And at one time, probably about 10, 15, no, probably about 15 years ago, I was sitting in meditation, it was suddenly like I was looked up to a mountaintop and I could see my whole life spread out before me. And I realized that, that the toughness I had was for me to heal a belief that I came in with to get over it. And so that belief in this case was that I can't experience God's love in human form. That I can experience God's love as spirit, but not here on earth. Here on earth, God's love does not exist for me. That was the belief. Now, is that a truth? No. But I set up the experience of not experiencing God's love pretty profoundly and pretty thoroughly so that I could have that and get over it. Does that make sense? We don't have our challenges because we've done something wrong. We have our challenges so we can get over it and experience what we really want to experience, which is oftentimes the counter or the opposite of that. So our children come in, they may be influenced by the, the consciousness around them, they may have come in with their own agenda, though we don't necessarily know what it is in consciousness. So ours is not to judge them, ours is not to say this is good, bad, right, or wrong, it's to provide them with all the support we can for their health and wholeness, which is what Jesus did with that guy. He didn't sit there and go, yeah, uh, how did you get here? You know, he never walks up to a person that he heals in, in any of the times and says, hey, well, what, you, what in your consciousness caused that? You know, he doesn't do that. He just heals if they ask for it. So does that help with, with whoever asked the, children, the question about the children and diseases? Was that a yes or? It's okay. We're good. This is one that really touched my heart. 
Um, I never feel satisfied. And what does science of mind say about that? When I'm looking outside for my satisfaction, if I'm looking to other people, things, circumstances, situations, I will never feel satisfied. When I look within to that source, what the reading was we heard, when I, when I come back to the central flame, I'm warm. When I get back to my source, I recognize that I'm in touch with the spring of water, as we talked about last week, that never dries up. It's within me. But as long as I'm externally focused, as long as I'm looking for something or somebody out there to satisfy me, I'm never going to feel satisfied. Because somebody or something out there can always betray me, can always leave. In fact, let me rephrase it. Will always leave. Will always leave, okay? None of us gets off this planet alive, right? At least not so far that I've seen. Anybody here immortal? Or no one immortal? Okay, good. In, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the Hindu tradition, it says everything that, rise, everything that has birth must die. And everything that dies must be born again, by the way. So there's this cycle of life. All forms that arise must fall. So the forms are the falseness. That's what we talk about when we talk about the illusion. The forms are just the forms of spirit. But it's the spirit itself. When we get to know the spirit itself, we do that deep inner work of getting back to knowing the source. Then we move into the state of being satisfied. We move into the source of satisfaction because then I recognize that I'm one with God and that this stuff out here, it's going to go up and down. It always does. But if I'm connected with the Spirit, that doesn't change, that doesn't shift. And so then I can stand in that firmness and then I can be satisfied not because of what's happening in my life out here, but because of who I recognize that I am and always have been and always will be and what it is that I recognize that I'm connected to. So satisfaction comes from and, and you know, in, the, in the reading today you know, Ernest talked about, about it. Um, a change of consciousness does not come by simply willing or wishing. It's not easy to hold mental attention to an ideal or the human experience is discordant but it is possible. And so we must be like God if I wish to realize God's spirit in my life. And so that's recognizing my oneness with an infinite presence. That's taking that in. That's opening to that love. That's opening to that constantly flowing spring of life, that source. And it's, again, not always easy. You've noticed, right? I've noticed. Yeah. But it's there. And so we keep turning back, we keep turning back, we keep in the midst of difficulties having, you know, I, I talked about this yesterday at the Intentions Retreat uh, workshop, have a mantra, and I talked about this a couple times before, have a mantra, have a phrase, have a something that pulls you back. You know, for me oftentimes it's there's only one life, there's only one life, there's only one life. You get out of a discord, out of, when I get into discord, excuse me, I remember and remind myself there's only one life or God is all there is. Those are kind of my two catchphrases. I know Reverend Mary mentioned one yesterday in class that she had that pulls her back, pulls her back. And so we have this bridge, so we can either go into the deep chasm of unhappiness, dissatisfaction, or we can shortcut that chasm by creating a bridge across it with our consciousness, with a phrase, with a word, with a, you know, Eddie Watkins helped us last Sunday create tunes, you know, whatever it is that it takes. You know, I don't care if it's a Hindu chant or, or you know, whatever it is, something that pulls us back out of that chasm and instead becomes a bridge to the other side and shortcuts the chasm. And what that is, is recognizing the oneness of the divine in some way or another. And our oneness with that infinite presence. So, are we good with that? Okay. Next question. Generally, I'd like these to be personal, but I'll, um, I kind of talked about this a, couple, a few weeks ago. I don't know if it was this service or the second service. How do we resolve the terrible things that ISIS is doing, like beheading and burning alive people with our teaching? I hope they're not burning people with our, with our teaching, but, but how do we resolve that with our teaching? Again, I'll go back to Jesus. Jesus said the poor you always have with you, and he wasn't necessarily talking about financial status. So whether it was Emperor Nero 
burning Christians to use for light in his garden. And I don't know if you know that, but he used to you know, set fire to captured Christians and use them as, as lanterns. Whether it's the Nazis, whether it's the Spanish Inquisition, have you noticed there's always been horrors on the planet? There's always been people who are doing things that are way out of alignment. And what we teach is we have free will. We have choice. And when we get out of alignment with choice, when we forget the path, when we, when we, what's the, the reading we had? Um, when we get out of alignment with a particular activity or alignment of spirit, do we come, uh, here we are. When we are out of harmony with some special good, when we are out of harmony with spirit, it is because we are off track along that particular line of the activity of spirit. And some people get way off track, have you noticed? Some people get way off track. It doesn't mean a teaching is good or bad. Some people use the same teaching. The same principles will work. I don't see this too often. I'm going to challenge. I may, I may push a couple buttons here, okay? So I'm going to just take a breath ahead of time. When September 11th happened, when the planes flew into the buildings, a few days after that, I heard about some of the background of that, and I said, you know what? They use the same principles that we teach to create that. They use the mastermind principle. They use wherever two or more are gathered with the same intent. They have these sleeper cells sitting in, 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 you know, around the country with a clear intent. They thought they were doing God's work. Okay? They, they visualized it. They mapped it out. They did everything they needed to do. Same principles. So we teach. And we can use the same principles just like, like we can use electricity to kill somebody or save somebody's life. It doesn't invalidate electricity or say electricity is bad when we use it to kill somebody. It's not the electricity that's the problem, is it? It's our use of it. And so this teaching works, these principles work, whether it's to save lives or destroy lives. There's all sorts of stuff around ISIS, and I don't, you know, I, I, I don't know what's the truth there, as far as the, the factual truth. You know, some people say that they're actually being funded by parts of the United States or whatever, or business factions or whatever. I don't know. I don't, you know, and for the purpose of this talk, I don't care. But they're still doing stuff that is out of alignment, and it's okay to say, look, that is way out of alignment. And we talked about this again yesterday in, the, in, our, in our class, in our workshop. And the question is, what am I going to do about that? What am I going to do about that? We talked about yesterday about global climate change. And people complain about global climate change, or they argue that it's not happening or whatever. What am I going to do about that? Am I going to say, well, they should do something about it? Or am I going to do something about it? And the most powerful thing I can do isn't just in the outer activities. It is the outer activities. But the most powerful thing I can do is within my own consciousness and say, where is that happening within me? It's the hard and deep part of this teaching. Where is that happening within me? Because if ISIS bothers me, if global warming bothers me, if any of that stuff out there, if, if children going hungry bothers me, then there's something within me that's being called to a higher space and a higher expression in that arena. Am I willing to say yes to that? Am I willing to stop complaining about it? Or Emma Curtis Hopkins says, complaining adds to the condition. Complaining adds to the condition. So the question is, what am I going to do about it? And it may be that the only thing I can do about it right now is just hold it in love in my consciousness and forgive the people who are involved. Because the people who are involved in doing stuff like that, anytime people are involved in hurting another person, it's because they're hurting themselves. It's because they're totally confused and they're not understanding the right use of law, and they're not understanding the right use of what the principles are, and they're not understanding the nature of God. Because if you believe in a God that is absolute love, and that all of us are one of God, you would recognize that every person you hurt is yourself. 
And so maybe, and, and, and we, we, I think we sometimes underestimate the power of focused affirmative prayer. Because focused affirmative prayer can shift consciousness, can shift things all over the place. We know people, I've talked before about people who have had physical healings out in their body because of affirmative prayer. When one part of the consciousness of the universe is changed, it affects everything in the universe. It affects everything. I remember Alan Watts used to say, who was a, a Zen Buddhist, used to say, um, there's not a baby burps in Mill Valley that doesn't affect the farthest star. Okay? And it was kind of a funny thing. He, he lived in Mill Valley. Um, there's more of a Zen saying that, that the beating of a butterfly's wings affects the entire planet. And so if we start in consciousness, instead of looking at ISIS and saying, oh, isn't that horrible? If we say, yes, that is horrible, and here's what I'm going to do about it. If it bothers me, I'm going to sit right down right now and I'm going to do a prayer. If it bothers me, I'm going to call a practitioner and help and ask that practitioner's help to get me centered so I can be a powerful change agent for good in this world. I'm going to do whatever it is that I need to do. If I feel called to write a letter to somebody, a politician, I will do that. If I feel called to do something, you know, whatever it is, but I will do something rather than just saying, ain't it awful, I will do something. And the first place I will recommend that you do something is within. Within. We start with that. We start with clearing up our own consciousness. Where does this live within me? Who am I hurting? Where do I feel separation? Where do I not see that person right there in front of me as God? And it's okay for me to just brush them off and treat them as I want to. And yours may be very minor, it ain't beheading and burning people, okay? But any time that we're starting to feel separation, any time that we don't recognize that person in front of us as God, we're starting down the exact same path we'll lead clear over to here. Most of us have brakes on that don't take us all that way. Does that help? Are we still okay? Take your breath. It, like I said, it's a hard teaching. But the answer is always, you know, as, as Ernest Holmes says, the integrity of the universe cannot be questioned or doubted. God is love. God is whole. God is all that. It can't be questioned or doubted. So if something is out of alignment, then it's within us, individually and collectively, it's out of alignment. And the best thing that we can do is to start to say, where does that exist within me? And how can I get myself back into deeper and deeper alignment? I remember Michael Beckwith one time talked about that he, was, he had done a lot of work to really clean up his life, to really, to really move into being the most deep spiritual being that he could. And he was having a dream one night, and he said it was like he was wearing this white jacket that had a couple of little dark spots on it. And recognizing that he needed to clean up those two little dark spots on his white jacket. He said he ended up literally on the floor, curled up in a fetal position, crying and going, I don't want to be that spiritual. You know, I want to have a little bit of, you know, something left, other, other than that. You know, and sometimes it feels that way. You know, I just got a, um, a, a strong invitation from, from my doctor after not seeing a doctor for about 15 years that suggested that I... Um, clean up my diet and exercise a little more and lose this. And there's a part of me that's sitting there going, I don't want to give up my chocolate cake. You know? I'm not having brownies, by the way, this morning. Thank you. Um, you know, there, there's, this, there's this part of me that's just like, no, I want to I wanna be able to eat saturated fats and, and you know, all that you know, horrible stuff for you. It tastes so good, you know. But there's a part of me that says, you know, and more than that, I want to live and live well and live healthy and enjoy my body. And so I make the choice to do the hard thing, the hard choice, and say, and at the same time, I'm going out walking, I'm changing my diet, I'm dropping all that stuff that she suggested I drop. And I have been, by the way. 
I might win the contest <laughs> out of necessity. <laughs> And so that's all kinds that we're called to do in the universe, is we're called to say, what's the next layer? What's the next level that I can let go of that has kept me separate from the infinite source, the infinite good? So that's, when we look at something like whether it's ISIS, whether it's Nazi Germany, whether it's the next thing that comes along down the road, there's a call that says, how can I, as a spiritual person, approach this with integrity, with love, and with harmony of spirit, and standing the power of the divine because Ernest Holmes said, if we use these teachings just to cope with our lives, we're misusing the teachings. So it's not a case of, I'm just going to sit there and wait, there's nothing I can do about it. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not a bury your head in the sand, nothing I can do about it. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is we stand in the power of God that we are, recognizing that we are the love, which is the nature of the universe. And we move into alignment with that, and we declare that that is not only true here in this spot, but it's true everywhere in the world, including every spot where a person from ISIS is. We remember the truth that they are also God, and we, help, and we hold that in truth until they remember it too. It's what a practitioner does with a client. You know, when you go to see a practitioner, it's usually because you've forgotten that you're God in form in some aspect of your life, and you sit down with a practitioner or the minister, and they help you to remember that. They hold that solidly for you until you remember it. And so you become a practitioner of this world every time you get a call in the news, whether it's, you know, whatever news item it is, to say, look, I'm going to do something different. Your friends may all be running around going, ain't an awful, ain't an awful, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to stand in the power of God that I truly am and declare that there's a different outcome going to happen. Are we good with that? Okay. A friend of mine used to say that, I, that she used, used the news as prayer requests. So her list of prayer requests for the week when she watches the news. Different way to watch the news, isn't it? And then finally, what does quantum physics have to do with science of mind? Nothing. Actually, I love quantum physics. Ernest was, was aware of quantum physics. Quantum physics was pretty young when he was writing a science of mind textbook. But quantum physics is a wonderful way of looking at the universe that, that recognizes the the what do I want to say? Um, the flexibility. Emerson says that, that uh, we, see, we look at life and see it as permanent or solid. The universe looks at life and sees it as a liquid law. Okay? And quantum physics starts to say, starts to prove and starts to demonstrate this liquid law. That everything is in constant motion, constant uh, flux. You know, moving from wave to particle, wave to particle, wave to particle, depending on what? Our observation of it, depending on our intention. Gosh, doesn't that sound a little bit like what we teach? Your life will show up as you intend it to. As you keep your intention strong enough, focused enough, long enough, it shows up as that. And so quantum physics is really a wonderful way. Quantum physics actually is kind of the science behind science of mind. And it's been proven more and more. It talks about there's infinite possibility. There's not just this many little you know, factors. It's infinite possibility. And so are we willing to play in this infinite possibility? It is the science behind science of mind. It is that which, which brings what we teach into scientific, um, the scientific paradigm, the scientific arena, and says, yes, there is scientific background for us. People have taught this teaching. For this, this teaching, what we teach, is not new. I mean, Jesus taught it. You know, Buddha taught it, the Hindus taught it. It's been taught for, for thousands of years. You know, in a couple of cases they call it um, uh, New Thought Ancient Wisdom. And so it's just ancient wisdom. But what was being done before was it was being intuitive. You know, the Taoists intuit, if, if you read the Tao Te Ching and some of the, 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 the cosmology of the Tao Te Ching, it's the intuition of the universe as scientists see it today. You know, one of my teachers used to say that the scientists will arrive at the mountaintop and find the mystics already sitting there. Because they've intuited it. They knew it. And so what quantum physics is doing is catching up with what our intuition, what our mentality, what our consciousness already knows. And saying, yeah, and by the way, this is how it works. So that's, what sci that's one, of the, one of the many things that quantum physics has to do with science of mind. So that's the questions that, that I got, and I thank you for those questions. There were, 
caring and deep and, and honest. So uh, I appreciate that. So let's move into prayer. I'm taking a deep breath. Hmm. I'm so grateful to know that there's one source. Of all the places that we could be today, of all the teachings that we could be involved in today, we have chosen this one. And sometimes this choice is, may seem conscious to us, and sometimes they may feel like the universe shoved us into it. But we are blessed to have this choice, this recognition, that there is one and only one. Now that source is love and pure love, good and pure good. Light and pure light. That there is no absence, there is no lack in this infinite presence. And so we recognize that as that is true of the infinite presence, and because it is infinite, because that is all that there is, we have to be one of it. Every aspect, every detail of life has to be one of this infinite presence. And whether we understand it or not, whether we remember it or not, whether we're even aware of it or not, it still is. We are one of that infinite presence. And so I speak my word that each of us is blessed by this process. Each of us comes to understand not only this teaching, but how this teaching affects our lives more fully and more powerfully. How to walk and live and breathe this teaching, which is simply the use of spirit to make our lives better and to make this world better. That is really all we're here for. We're here to be at one with the infinite and at one with this world, which is part of the infinite, an expression of the infinite. And so I'm grateful that we have said yes to this. I'm grateful for the good that comes from this. I'm grateful for our willingness to be a part of this dance of life, part of this awakening, waking up to the truth of who we are. And so I bless each person here. I call each of us good. Each person who hears this, I know that it is that our whole process, our whole understanding and application of the science of mind, of this truth teaching, of the highest and best, of life unfolds perfectly in our lives right here, right now. And so I release this, I let it be, and together we say, and so it is. Thank you. I'm going to call the ushers forward. Sir.